So now let's talk the amazing David Lynch. His film from 2001, Mulholland Drive, with Naomi Watts and oh, what's her name? I always forget it. Harry. But um, for people who haven't seen this movie, I highly recommend you go watch this movie. But if you're going to hang around, then it's so hard to talk about Lynch. Shut up, notification. It's so hard to talk about Lynch and dissect his films, man. When I did Eraserhead like, a long while ago, not a good decision to do it at 3 in, three in the morning. I mean, it was, it was fun to watch it, good time to watch it, like 1 a.m. Not a good time to talk about it and analyze it at 3 a.m. <laughs> that did not work out well. But this film, for me, is my favorite film by Lynch. Like, all of his films are near to masterpieces for me. But this one is my favorite. If I had to say, like, his best work, it would be Twin Peaks, like, the whole three seasons and Fire Walk With Me. That's his magnum opus for me. And I'm sure for a lot of people. I think his magnum opus, film-wise, in scope and everything, is Inland Empire. But I know a lot of people who don't care for that one that much love it. That one will come soon, and that's going to be insane <laughs> trying to talk about and interpret that movie. But this film, for me, is just perfect in every way. It is just trademark Lynch all over the place. It, it revolves around a dream. For people who haven't seen it, a short little plot synopsis in the best way I can. It is about this woman... Diane Selwyn, who ends up moving to Los Angeles to be an aspiring actress. And things start not going her way. Like, she ends up in this love tryst with another woman, and there's uh, another actress who keeps taking the roles that she thinks that she deserves. And we're basically in the first 45 minutes or longer, first hour plus of this film, we're seeing mostly her in a, like a dream or a delusion, there's been some theories. There's so much to interpret and talk about here. This is going to be a long one. Like, I know that for a fact. But so much to unpack. Like, all the things, what they mean. The the, the blue box and the blue key, the cowboy. the uh, And for those of you who haven't seen this, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But all of that, um, the, the bum... Well, behind uh, Winkies, which is one of the best jump scares in a film. Oh, it's so good. What a mess. That's how you do a goddamn jump scare. I'll be talking about that scene just a decent amount when we get there. But everything is just perfect in this. And the blanket for the directing, the editing, the, the sound design. Lynch is the only director that I have to watch his films always with headphones because his sound design is in my opinion i think he, he he has the best sound design of anybody in film like he is the best with sound design and through all the twin peaks all of his films just he's a master and it's just listening to the film with headphones it's so much more immersive, man. It really is. And for the type of films that Lynch makes, <laughs> they're already very visually stimulating, very immersive, with you know, mind-wise, too. It just gets you thinking in a million different directions. When you put headphones on and listen to a Lynch film and while you're watching with headphones, nothing like it. Like, it just adds so much to the experience. And with The Return, uh, Season 3 of Twin Peaks unbelievable the sound design in that like that was on a completely different like stratosphere galley galley <laughs> galaxy universe level like absolutely phenomenal sound design the acting is is perfect in this naomi white white why can't i speak because i can never speak no naomi watt fantastic as always one of my favorite performances by her for sure. Like, she kills it in this. Harrington is amazing, too. Everybody. There's not a bad performance, just like any other David Lynch film. So, let's talk about Mulholland Drive. I don't know how, and I still haven't given that uh, spoiler-free synopsis yet. <laughs> so, she ends up going, and it doesn't end up working out for her, so we're living in her delusion, basically. And for the first, like I said, hour plus, 
we're not seeing reality until reality starts colliding, you know, and coming to fruition and breaking through at the end. But there's so much to interpret. There's so many theories. There's so much to talk about. Let's do it. Just from the, the first moments with the jitterbug scene, already you know what you're in for, whether you're a Lynch fan or you're not. Just the, the purple background. It's just a blank background, just purple in color. And then the same dancers, but dancing in different poses and choreographs and stuff like that. Surreal as can be. Lynch as can be. The song is awesome. <laughs> the jitterbug's great. And then we see the flash of Betty with the two, uh, the old couple that she travels with and then attacks her uh, later on in the movie. I don't even know the best way to talk about this movie. Like, probably should just go through the the first half of the movie, you know, first part of it, the dream, or whatever you want to call it. And then, as reality unfolds, try to interpret what all those, all the little things and pieces of this puzzle mean in reality. It's probably the best way to do it, so we'll do it that way. So we have the, after the jitterbug, we have the opening uh, POV cam of Diane in her apartment. And... There's a theory. I forget if I mentioned it because I've already started this video, got like seven minutes in, and then my camera fucked up. So then I had to redo it. So if I say something again, it's because I'm thinking that it's from the last time. <laughs> so whatever. But there's a theory that she, you can hear the sound of her like smoking cocaine crack. Interesting theory, but it's, it's whatever. I don't buy that at all like it, you just hear her like exhale basically so i mean we know how she is she's not in touch with reality so i don't think she's smoking crack i mean i think that's a pretty long stretch and they say that like that leads to this whole delusion like it's a drug-induced stupor it's like a drug-induced delusion that she's living in her head again interesting i don't buy it we have frequent lynch collaborator and amazing Twin Peaks composer uh, Angelo Badalamente, who is just sublime. The music in this, the score in this is so good. It's so haunting and ominous, but it's also beautiful and dreamlike and fits the whole dream theme throughout all of this. I, he can't do any wrong, Badalamente. Like, what a great composer. Even though I already gave some spoilers and stuff, but from here on, full on spoilers and explanations and theories and stuff like that for people who haven't seen it and want to see it first. All right, first of all, it's not Harrington. <laughs> it's Harring. Laura Harring. And I wanted to say Laura, so whatever. We'll split the difference on who was correct, <laughs> even though I was the only one saying anything. But she plays Rita in the delusion here, and, well, and in reality, but we'll get there. And she's on Mulholland Drive in Los Angeles, in a car with these two men dressed in black and one turns back and tells her to get out of the car and points a gun at her and before they can react a car comes and hits them dead on destroys this car she survives and she ends up losing her memory she doesn't know who she is she has total amnesia this is something that only pretty decent lynch fans will get this little reference but the um when you see one of the ambulances on it, it says 119 for the reflection. And in Twin Peaks The Return, we hear a character, a very minor character, screaming out 119, 11. Nice little reference to this. So the police show up, detectives and everything for this car accident, and they assume that there's somebody missing because they find stuff in the back seat, And... We have Robert Forster here, who I adore, and I, oh, I was so gutted to hear he passed away just like a year or two after Twin Peaks The Return. What a fantastic actor, man. Like, he's been in so many great things. Jackie Brown and uh, Twin Peaks The Return, Breaking Bad, and more recently stuff. But he's uh, so much stuff he's been in, and he's so great in everything. And it's sad seeing him actually here because I wish he was still alive and was able to still do amazing roles. Now, Rita, the one with amnesia, 
she go wanders into town into LA from a Holland Drive, and she ends up sleeping like in some in a, a yard. And then we get to the Winky scene with one of the best jump scares in a film. Now, what do I want to say about this first? There's so much to talk about just in the scene alone. First of all, when you see this movie for the first time, you don't know these characters at all. You, we don't know their names. We don't know anything about them. They're just sitting in Winkies on Sunset Boulevard, which if you're a Lynch fan, you know how much Lynch adores the film Sunset Boulevard from the 50s. And there's a decent amount of references in here. I'm pretty sure the main character from that movie, I haven't seen him forever, Norma, uh, Norma Desmond, which Norma Jennings from Twin Peaks is named after that, and Desmond uh, Chester Desmond from uh, Fire Walk With Me, named after that too. But I'm pretty sure we see Norma's car also in this. So there's Sunset Boulevard references in a, pretty much all of Lynch's stuff, but good to point out. So we know nothing about these people, but the way that Lynch builds the, the suspense here and the tension and the dreamlike feeling with the camera work that just, and, and like the extras in the background that are all eating, you can't hear anything from them. All you hear is the dialogue between the two men here. So it adds some creepiness just like that and makes it feel very dreamlike. That it, They feel isolated. They feel like it's just them. Great job with that. Then it just starts building with his story. And he starts telling his friend here that he had a dream twice now. That the two of them were at this specific Winkies. And he's sitting there at the table. And he is frightened beyond belief. And he doesn't know why. He knows that it's a feeling he has that there's a man behind the Winkies. And he has a hideous face, and he hopes that he never sees him in real life. Already right here. Like, and this is, it's, it's such a unique jump scare, man, because it, it's not your usual jump scare. There's, well, there's so much. <laughs> I'm going to keep saying that. But, for the first part, like like I said, we don't know these people, so th there should be no investment. But because of just the way it's filmed and the dialogue and how dreamlike it feels, it pulls you in. It's like it's hypnotic. To quote, I forgot who it was from earlier with the City of the Living Dead. Same thing. And when they finally get to the part when he says he looks over at the counter and sees his friend standing there in the dreams that he had and he's just as scared as he is. And then they walk outside to the back and there's that hideous man there. Now, then it starts playing out just like the dream because his friend gets up after the conversation, walks to the counter and then the man turns around and that's when he sees his friend at the counter, just like in his dream. So we know this is, just like his dream and all of this is happening in diane's mind by the way so there's a whole bunch of layers here but this is all just concocted in her mind the bum in the back she's played by the same woman who plays the nun in the conjuring 2 fun fact the makeup is so great on her <laughs> like she is scary like what a scary character and we see her again at the end of the movie. Just him referring to her, since it's a woman, as a man, the scary, frightening man in the back, makes it more dreamy and just weird and eerie, too, that when you finally see it, because it's not a man. There's just so much expertise in filmmaking that goes in just this scene alone. And they end up leaving, and they go around the back, and the camera work, man, is phenomenal. Just in front of them, and just it's bringing them there, and you're looking at them, and they are terrified, especially the main guy. And then we're taken for the ride, and we're going, we're looking right at this wall in the back of this Winkies. And as soon as he gets close to the wall, just perfect shot of what hideous woman pops out 
and we don't get a loud, violent sting like with jump scares today, like dun or anything like that. We actually have the sound drown out and just go down to low bass and this guy passes out or dies. It's never really explained. A fright that the, the, the dreams actually is was true. And oh, the jump scare is just so amazing. It's done so masterfully well. One of the best in, in a film. If you haven't seen it, at least watch this scene. Look it up on YouTube. Like, uh, put in whatever, a Mulholland Drive bum scene or, or winky scene. Check it out. It, it's phenomenal. I guess this is the way to talk about this then. But, all right, so then who is she in the back? What I always took from it is just how hideous she is, how frightened this character is of her, or of the man that he calls it. It represents Diane's failure and guilt and, and all of that, all the negative feelings and evil and stuff like that. And that's why in her delusion, we're having this scene in the first place, that these people, especially this main guy, can feel that it's back there. So she can feel her, her failure. She can feel that she never became this amazing actress or successful that she wanted to be. And that's what this thing represents and that she never wants to see this thing in real life. So she never wants to experience failure, but as we know, she does. So when they walk out back and they see it, that's it popping out <laughs> and showing his face. Her failure, her guilt, her, her feeling uh, so guilty about putting a hit out <laughs> on her competitor. And then that she had a, she had a lover's tryst with her too, right? Like in, in, in the reality, not in the dream. I don't know. We'll find out. Another thing with the, the bum that's brilliant in that jump scare you see it just slide into frame for that, that small second to see, like, what the fuck is that? And then w you see the shot of it sliding back behind the wall, disappearing, but you, you can't see the face. Like, it's already made its way back, so you don't get to see it again. And on your first watch, it's, <laughs> it's, it's mind-blowing. Such great stuff. Then we end up getting to the... I don't even know what to call them. They're kind of like who's behind Hollywood, like the people who control Hollywood and filmmaking and everything like that. And then you have the weird looking character, man, who plays, uh, the King of Hollywood. So weird, just, just for weird sake, but it works. And then they're making phone calls and they say the girl's still missing. Now, when they show the last phone and you have the lamp right there, that's Diane's phone at the end of the movie. So, in her fantasy here, are they saying that she's missing? And what is that supposed to represent? That she's, again, like her failures and stuff? That she, or her loss with reality? Let me know. Let me know in the comments. And if, if uh, you're watching this in the premiere, start throwing out theories for everything in here. Because <laughs> I'm going to need them. So... We have Betty's first scene of her arriving in L.A. off the air, off the airport, off the airport, <laughs> at the airport, off the airplane, or at the airport, off the airplane. And she looks great. She looks just cheerful and optimistic and everything that she's finally here. And as she says in a little bit, that she feels like she's entered this dream world. And Irene and the old man, too, I'm guessing they're a couple, right, that are on the trip with them that she ends up talking to and they wish her good luck and everything and that we'll be looking for you on TV. We see them, as I said, a flash at the very beginning after the jitterbug scene with her. And then we see them later on in the film when they come out of the bag that the bum drops in the back of uh, Winkies. And we see the miniature versions of them. And then they come to Diane's apartment and the whole climactic ending happens. So, are these in real life? I forget if they show them. I gotta wait for that to see what they represent, like, in the dream. But uh, they could be relatives of hers. They could be... They could be just people that she did meet when she first, you know, moved to L.A. But we'll figure out more theories for that. But yeah, we see a lot of that here in the whole first part of the movie, in the dream. That she pulls in a bunch of characters and faces and names and everything from 
reality. And we see Coco, the landlady, her uh, landlord. She is actually, we see later on, is the director of the film that uh, Camilla ends up getting the part over her. It's his mother in real life. So she ended up using that and pulling her into her fantasy world as the landlord for her apartment. That apparently it's her aunt's apartment. Now, this is taking place in the dream. So is it actually the aunt's apartment? Like, does she have an aunt or anything like that? I'll just go with maybe it is, but we'll see. Who plays Coco? It's Ann Miller, right? She, 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 I've seen her in a lot of stuff. I'm pretty sure it's Ann Miller. So after her, her conversation with Coco, she ends up going into her apartment, uh, her aunt's apartment, and finds Rita, the amnesiac, in the shower, showering. And then they talk for a little bit, and she ends up telling her that she was in an accident and everything, and that she can't remember who she is. And just the dynamic between the two of them in this film is excellent. Not to mention we get a nice little like lesbian sex scene between the two of them later. So the whole conspiracy Hollywood mob, kind of, if you will, they are pretty much like a mob for Hollywood. And they, in the dream sequence here, the whole uh, alternate reality she's thinking, the director of the film that she doesn't get the role for is being threatened to, and ends up eventually being threatened to use Camilla, another, the other actress, in his movie, and not Betty, even though he kind of wanted to use her, and everybody that she auditioned in front of loved her, except for the director of the film. So this whole conspiracy in Hollywood of who to cast for this role, and the reason that Betty's not making it the way that she wished that she would i'm guessing all of that just represents you know a justification for why she didn't hit it big for why her career never took off for why she's losing touch with reality and that why she didn't get these parts it's all a conspiracy against her like the, the people of hollywood are you know it's it's all about money it's all about who you know and stuff and she's not in the know it's all this big conspiracy that she sees against herself. That's how I've always taken the whole mob of Hollywood thing. It's a cool cameo from uh, Angelo Badalamenti, the composer, in the Hollywood mob, for lack of a better term, um, meeting that they have with the director, Adam Kesher. I think it's Adam, right? It's Kesher, I know that for a fact. But, again, the whole King of Hollywood look and everything is, is is just so eerie man like this guy looks ridiculous and that's another thing that adds to what i think this all means to her in her mind in this you know fantasy world of hers he looks corrupted and it it's he's the king of hollywood so it's just he has to be the most you know unnatural looking the most inhuman looking he has to look the way that he looks, to look at just as corrupt as he actually is, or she perceives Hollywood to be against her. And of course, only Michael Anderson could have played him, <laughs> because just how he looks to begin with, but just the whole get-up that they put him in and stuff, it looks excellent here. Now, I forget a lot about the, you know, the start of this project, but this was supposed to be a series, and the film what became the film started off as a pilot for the series. And then I forgot what happened, but then they ended up turning it into a feature film, which I think was a, such a good decision. Mr. Roke, that's his actual name, the king of Hollywood dude. But the scene where the guy comes in and talks to him and says that, you know, the woman's name is Camilla Rhodes, the actress that they want. And the director doesn't want her. Should we, you know, cancel the whole thing? And he tells him, you know, not to. But all of that, the cinematography is gorgeous. And the dreamlike feeling is off the walls. The sound design with the the background noise, white noises type, like low rumble. And like we hear in a lot of Lynch stuff. It looks like Black Lodge-ish. Black Lodge-ish. All right, good. Two tries. It wasn't like Wizard of Oz-ish, 
that took me seven in Inglorious Bastards. So we're doing better. But it it looks just so surreal. It looks fantastic. Just everything looks so still in a lot of scenes in Lynch's work. And it just amplifies that dream feeling and that surrealism to the extreme. Like he, the way that he films scenes with just long pauses of just hearing the, that white noise or whatever sound design and music that's going on at the time, sound effects and stuff. And how it's just, he lingers on characters standing there and the background and how it's lit and the, and the cinematography, it just, it looks so still. It, it feels alien. He, he's the master. He, David Lynch is, I, I always say this, one of my favorite directors of all time, one of my favorite human beings to ever exist. And he's just a director in his own galaxy. Like, there's nobody like David Lynch. Now, let's talk the Hitman. So, we know Diane Selwyn, in reality, puts out a hit on you know the competitor, competitor actress. I forget her name in reality. Is it Camilla? Or is it... We'll find out. But the hitman goes to kill this person and botches this hit in the dream. And ends up... The bullet goes through the wall when he shoots the one dude that he's there for. He's there to grab a book of phone numbers. And we see in Diane's meeting with him in reality later when she's setting up the hit and he gives her the blue key. We see him, he has that same book there. So that's just another thing she pulled out of reality and used here to, I guess, represent the hitman. Same with the key, but we'll get to that in the box because there's a lot there. But he has the bullet goes through the wall and shoots some other woman, like hits another woman. He has to kill her, and then the janitor's there, and he's like, Can you come in here for a second? <laughs> he's got to kill this guy, this guy too. Now, I think the number three is pretty significant significant in this film we see the hitman here he like i said he kills three people the cowboy we see three times in the film that well diane sees him three times right yeah diane sees him three times and the cashier gets a visit from him and then he gets the line from the cowboy when catcher has the meeting with him saying if you see if you're good and he's like, in the dream, he represents, I guess, just a hitman for the mob or another person who works for the, you know, Hollywood and stuff like that, threatening him to stay in line and follow what they're telling him to do and cast the actress and everything. So he says to Kesher that if you're good, you'll see me two more times. If you're bad, you'll see me one more time. And uh, then he walks off. And uh, then we, so that's three times in total. Diane, or Betty, if you will, and us as the audience, we see him three times also. We see him... I, I think there's a one other scene, but maybe that scene. But then she sees him two more times, meaning she's bad, because she put out the hit. So the number three is in this movie a lot. And there's probably some other things that I'm not even remembering or never even noticed. So... Betty talks to her aunt on the phone, and earlier when she found Rita in her apartment, Rita said that she knew her aunt, was a friend of hers, and that's why she was there. And then this is when she confronts her and says, you, you know, you lied to me, and this is when she lets out the whole truth that she doesn't remember who she actually is. Now, for as for who and what Rita repre represents, a few things. I mean, obviously, the rival actress that Diane you know, once took took the hit out on that she had the little love relationship with also represents herself that she doesn't have an identity. She lost her identity completely, just like how Diane lost her mind. So it's a projection of herself and we see this later on near the end when she puts on the blonde wig and she looks uh, Rita and she looks a lot a lot just like Diane and, or slash Betty. So it's a projection of herself and also of her, you know, ex lover and the rival actress. So a lot of symbolism just with Rita as a character. And yeah, we're at a half hour and we're not even halfway through this movie. So, like I said, it's going to be a long one, just like a race ad. 
now here where she goes through her purse by uh from betty's suggestion to see if she has you know a license or anything like that an identification to find out who she really is and she pulls out wads of cash now i always pictured that as obviously her what she desires like what she wanted out of her career and stuff like she envisioned this great career as an actress for herself making a lot of money and doing great projects and films and stuff so that for me represents that for her that that's what she wishes she had and she doesn't and it's just more of her failure and stuff like that but we see the hitman here with some woman is she a prostitute or something like that i don't know so this could be where he she pulls him into the dream as the hitman in the dream now the whole thing with the blue key i'm not going to get into the box until later but they find the blue key also in her purse and the color blue is used a lot in this film and i always took it as death like she we see the box in Diane's drawer at the end of the movie when she reaches for the gun. The key is blue. And we have the scene when she's in the Winkies talking to the hitman and setting up the hit. He gives her the key, the blue key, and says, you know, I, when it's done, you'll find this where I said I'll leave it. And she asks, what does it open? And he just laughs at the question in classic Lynch, like over the top laughter <laughs> at a comment that we've seen in a lot of stuff from him, especially twin peaks. And that leads me to think that it's, it doesn't open anything. That's just his way of letting her know that the hit is done, that the job's done when, so he just leaves it, you know, as a, as a cue that here you go. It's all it. The job is taken care of. That's what I think it represents. But to her, it represents something in her delusion. It's a mystery to her that it's supposed to fit in the blue box. I mean, I guess we'll talk a little about the blue box. I always took it as kind of representing how Diane is sucked away from reality and also how she's spit back into reality at the end of the film. And it makes sense because seeing the blue key, which is supposed to represent the hit, the thing that she feels really guilty of after she puts an emotion, snaps her back to the reality of the situation that she put a hit out on this woman. Like, this, she did this, and now she, she would have to live with this. And just seeing the blue key unlocks that in her mind and brings it to the surface, and that's the symbolism of it opening the box. Anyone else have great theories on it? Put them in the comments. Put them in the chat. Love to hear them. Adam is his name. Kesher. I forget even if I said Adam, but that's his name. The whole scene when he comes back and finds his his girlfriend or wife, I'm not sure which, in bed with another guy. <laughs> yeah, oh no, it's his wife. He just said it. The, uh, the guy who was fucking his wife. So he walks in and finds that, and the first thing he does is he goes and grabs the jewelry box, and he ends up taking pink paint and pouring it over the jewelry as, fuck you, you ain't getting any of this. I'm ruining it all. Now, it could just be, if, you know, just this innocent scene here that doesn't have deeper meaning, but if you want to look deeper into it, the jewelry is valuable. It's another thing that Diane values in life, and this is showing that it's again it's being destroyed that everything that she values everything that she sought out to do is is failing and that it's being destroyed on her the scene when diane well betty that's going to happen a lot i'm surprised that hasn't happened more often betty and rita are in the winkies and then we see the waitress who she also sees in real life so she pulls her as a face in to her fantasy world and her name tag and her name is diane which is just a reference to herself and that triggers rita's memory a little bit and she thinks that her name might be diane and thinks that it might be diane selwyn again showing how rita is like a split projection of you know the other actress and lover and her herself 
that now that name, hearing her own name, seeing her own name, is triggering memories and trying to bring her back to reality. So then Kesher, the director, gets a visit from, he's staying at a hotel, and he's saying that two men stop by from his bank, the conspiracy Hollywood people, and told him to tell Kesher that he's, his line of credit's done, his, his, his bank is drained, <laughs> so he's broke now. Like, they're freezing his money, they're taking everything from him, they are blackmailing him into doing everything that they want for this film, which primarily is to cast the other actress and not Betty. In the dream world. Then we get another character representing, you know, uh, reality trying to break through to Diane, with the old woman who knocks on the door. And she starts saying, like, something bad's going to happen. And, like, you're, what are you doing in Ruth's apartment? She says, I'm Betty. I'm her niece. She's let me stay here. And she's like, that's not the name she said. And, it's like, someone's in trouble. Something bad's happening. So this is reality just trying to break through to her and, you know, try to bring her back from her crazy delusions. And as always with Lynch, we get a lot of electricity stuff in here, particularly when Catcher here goes to um, meet the cowboy at the ranch and we see the light bulb start to flicker on with the electricity sound the sound design just again excellent and this whole scene we talked about it already with the cowboy and saying if you see me two more times if you're good one more time if you're bad or no one more time if you're bad two more times if you're good so again this represents how many times she diane sees him and she's been bad so, not good to see him uh, twice. Yeah, what a phenomenal scene with the cowboy, man. And then him just saying right after those lines, he just says, good night, walks off, and then the light bulb flickers again and goes out. So, just what a creepy character, too, man. Like, that's such a surreal scene. And the cinematography, again, is amazing. Just the way, how still everything looks, how dark it is, like, out there in the desert, like, on the ranch. Everything looks great. Yeah, the chemistry between Harring, not Harrington, and uh, Naomi Watts is just so good in this, especially when they're doing the lines for the audition that she has the next day, and they're going back and forth off each other. Like, what a great dynamic. Her audition scene is great. Now, again, since this is taking place as Betty in this fantasy, is she really this talented in real life as Diane? I don't know. Like, we don't see her act as Diane. So we can't really determine that. But this could just be a delusion in her head that... <laughs> Carrie, you'll laugh at this. We were just talking about it. Like, in, uh, it's always sunny in Philadelphia at the reunion, high school reunion. And they're dancing, and they think it's uh, phenomenal. And then we see it's just absolutely atrocious, and they're doing terrible. <laughs> so who knows if this is just in her you know, subconscious, in her mind... That she's this phenomenal actress and she's just not and that led to you know her not making it or she really is a great actress and she just you know didn't didn't get lucky and she didn't get the part there's no conspiracy against her and she just you know it has to justify all this because she can't admit to herself that she didn't make it here that she didn't fill like fulfill her dreams in any way that she wanted because everyone in the room loves her audition here. They all love it, except for the director of the film. He, just like, again, like with Kesher and stuff, in her, this fantasy world, the director always has something against her. Like, he's the only one not impressed. And that's another, another justification in her mind for why she got, you know, picked. Didn't get picked. <laughs> <laughs> to uh you know the other the other actress speaking of uh the color blue earlier and how i think it represents death and you know the ultimate demise of diane's character but we also see it too um obviously in club silencio with the the woman you know at silencio with the blue hair but we also see it with one of the hollywood uh mob guys that in his suit he has a blue like a handkerchief or something in there. And again, that could just be the same type of thing that rep not death, but 
this delusion of this whole conspiracy against her and her not making it big results in her death, ultimately. So it still is linked to the whole death thing. So great usage of him. And Lynch does this all the time with the color usage. And blue, particularly. I mean, look at all blue rose in Twin Peaks. Now, Camilla, the actress that Catcher is forced to uh, pick over Betty, even though he seems very smitten with Betty and that he'd like to cast her, but he was just threatened by the cowboy. That sounds so ridiculous. <laughs> Without any contact, context, if someone just heard, like, he was threatened by a cow- she was threatened by a cowboy or he was threatened by a cowboy, it makes no sense. But it did happen because it's a Lynch film. And the whole, yeah, Camilla thing, another projection of Diane herself of everything she wished she was. You know, as she wished that she was like this rival actress in reality. So in the dream world, it's pretty much everything that she wants for herself, everything, all the success that she wanted, the, her dreams being fulfilled. That's for me what Camilla represents there. And a little and also represents kind of like Rita in the dream, you know, her real life, you know, rival and lover. Now they go Rita and Betty to Diane Selwyn in the dreams apartment and the neighbor here I forget is it's the same woman near the end that it, it's heavily implied that Diane in real life had this type of lover relationship with after you know had the fallout with her rival if you will isn't it the same woman and that's where she pulled this this lady's face from pretty sure so they break into Diane's apartment, which it's number 17, even though when they looked it up, it was number 12. And the neighbor says that they switched apartments. Now, is it because they were, like I said, a couple in real life? And when they fell out, then she moved out because she's taking things out of Diane's apartment near the end and like says, like, I don't want to forget anything. So I'm pretty sure that explains the neighbor. But they break into Diane, quote unquote, apartment, and great scene, great tension, and then they find the body in bed that's posed just like Diane's body after she shoots herself at the end of the movie. So this is just showing her ultimate fate, like what's going to happen to her. And I mean, I don't know how she knows this ahead of time, like, but like before she kills herself, but it's a dream. So, or delusion, fantasy, doesn't really matter. And the effects on the dead corpse look great. Like, (laughs) really, really, like, creepy looking. Also, with blue, we have, in a lot of this film, Betty's wearing blue. Which, again, represents death. Which is ultimately what befalls her. Now, this I just thought of. But when we see Rita put on the blonde wig, like I said earlier, like, it's merging reality, trying to bring her back to reality and merging this projection of herself with her actual projection of her self in the dream. <laughs> if that makes any sense at all. But here's where we get nice tits from uh, Haring, Naomi Watts, great. And then, <laughs> great scene. Great stuff. And she says before she she, she asks um, Rita that you're going to wear that wig to sleep. You don't have to wear it inside. And she says, no, I'm just, I was looking at myself. I'm going to take it off when I go to sleep. So when she goes to sleep, she sheds herself a bit. Like she is not who she really is. Just like in a dream. Like when she dreams, she's somebody different. So her taking the wig off before going to bed, pretty sure that's what that might mean. So then they go to Club Silencio, and she's wearing the blonde wig again. And the guy who's talking at the beginning about no hay banda, and there's no band, but we still hear the sounds, he starts saying again that, you know, that this is an illusion, that this is all tape, this is a tape recording, referring to this not being reality. So her going to Silencio here and kind of merging with Rita a bit, and the other actress in her mind. This is trying to snap her back to reality also. And then we see the woman with the blue hair, who says Silencio at the end. Then we just get such a great scene with the the woman who comes down and starts singing Spanish. 
pretty sure it's Spanish, right? Yeah, it's called Silencio, the club. But she's singing, and before she comes out, just trademark Lynch with the curtains and the color and how with the sound, so trippy, so so just out there, and just their reactions to the performance. Like, they're getting all, they're starting to break down, just like, you know, this delusion. Also, I think it's interesting, just saw this too now. The woman with the blue hair, she's sitting in like a box seat above them, kind of like death looking out, like looming over them, like, or specifically Diane. Just thought of that, and it makes sense, right? <laughs> now, Rita has the blue box and the key. Puts it in, opens it, and she's just sucked out of, not reality, because it's a, it's a fantasy, but you know what I mean. She's just sucked out of existence. Like I said, bringing reality to the surface, you know, unlocking reality. Rita isn't real. <laughs> she's just a projection in the mind of a very sick and depressed and just crazy woman that she turns into when her mind goes. Then we have the cowboy who shows up. He knocks on the door, and Diane, now, we're in, like, no, well, it's, I'm not sure, it's still Betty? Probably, so, yeah, because he says, he leans in, and he says, time to wake up now. So, this is signaling her waking up, obviously, from this delusion and into reality. This is the first time he, that she sees her. Then, later on, in a little bit, when they're at the you know, the gallons, whatever, for lack of better terms, and all, we start seeing all these familiar faces in the real world. She ends up seeing the cowboy walk, it's real quick, like, he, uh, I forget who walks away. Someone walks away, and uh, then she, the cowboy walks right past in the background. So that's the second time, because she's been bad. Yeah, so now she's Diane, and that was the neighbor from earlier, same woman. So, again, a, a fallback, you know, relationship that she possibly had, because she's moving stuff out of the apartment, and that explained in the fantasy, in the dream, why she, you know, switched apartments. Uh, Diane, the dream Diane. Yeah, this gets so confusing, man, you have no idea. So, that happens. Then she sees the blue key on the table, which is supposed to signify that the hit's done. And this is another thing that I think that's the biggest thing, probably, that snaps her fully out of this delusion into actual reality, leading to the climax of this film. So then we see the real Camilla in real life, which is Laura Herring, who was Rita in the fantasy. And she had her whole lover's tryst with her, didn't work out. She got picked over, you know, over Diane, and this leads to her putting out a hit on her. And probably the biggest thing that causes her to put this hit out is she goes on set and she sees Kesher making out with Camilla, a.k.a. Rita. <laughs> so that sends her completely over the edge. Then we get Naomi Watts' sad masturbation angry scene. <laughs> Sad to angry masturbation scene. Uh, then this is where the phone rings and we see the red lamp. So this is how we know that this is the same phone in the fantasy that the Hollywood mob you know, ended up trying to call and said was missing. So Camilla and Diane go to this gala for the film and everything. All the film crew and workers are there. Director Kesher is there and that's where we see and meet Coco in the dream, which is his mother here in reality. And then this is where she has an argument with Camilla and has this whole little causes a ruckus. Can you describe the ruckus, sir? And then you see the cowboy for the second time. That's right. She doesn't have an aunt in real life, because she just says that uh, when her aunt died, she left her some money. So yeah, the aunt thing was just another concoction. Then we see the Camilla from the fantasy come up to do it so hard keep a track of all these names and alternate characters comes up to uh, Camilla aka Rita and kisses her in front of Diane and she's furious at that too so that's where she drew in you know from her hatred for this girl made her you know Camilla in the fantasy in her dream and then they announce that they're getting married 
Asher and uh, Camilla. So that's the breaking point. The final straw has been broken. And then we see the scene with the hitman in Winkies with Diane. And the wait- same waitress. So that's the face she took into her uh, fantasy. And her name is Betty. So that's where we find out where she took her own fantasy name from. We also see the man from earlier on with the bum scene in Winkies that she sees standing there. And she sees him standing over at the counter, just like the man in the dream says that he saw his friend in his dream standing by the counter, (laughs) if that makes sense. So then in just another brilliant scene where we get the shots and a short little sequence of the bum behind the Winkies, who now has the blue box. So, again, if the bum represents her failures and her anxieties and biggest fears and stuff in life, evil pretty much, then this is that letting out the floodgates, opening the floodgates and letting reality set in. Like, it's completely taken over. Her fear, all her worst fears has come true, all her dreams are shattered, and evils prevailed over her, basically. Then we see the small versions of the couple that come out of the paper bag that the uh, bum drops that has the uh, blue box in it too so do they come out of the box or were they in the bag i don't know i don't know what them being small means but obviously they're coming back to haunt her that everything that she's done wrong the hit that she put out the guilt the loss the you know lack of fame and success all comes back to haunt her in the end here great sequence the ending's phenomenal just just like everything else in this film every scene every frame is is fucking perfect and they grow to big size after knocking on the door a few times again like reality's knocking at the door saying like it's time like fantasy world is done and they end up crawling under the door and then they grow big and they start chasing after her she freaks out she jumps onto her bed opens her desk and then we see the blue box in there and she pulls the gun out, shoots herself in the head, and then just the, the smoke that comes up from her body afterwards. That looks so good, man. And then we just get the final shots here. We get the uh, shot of the bum with blue behind it, the curtains from Club Silencio, again, with the bum there, and the blue signifying death. Yeah. This is her flash of death, like her existence has ended and all those insecurities and failures have trumped over her life uh, then of course the famous ending line from the woman with the blue hair at club silencio that everything is blue again and stuff and then light goes out everything reverts back to normal color and then we just hear her say silencio everything in diane's life has ceased she ceases to exist everything is silent everything is done that's my explanations and theories and interpretations for Mulholland Drive. Let me guys know, let me know your guys's. I love hearing theories and interpretations of this film. It's a masterpiece. It's my favorite Lynch film, and again, a daunting task <laughs> dissecting Lynch, but gave it my best. Take care, guys. Mm-hmm.